Hi, and welcome to Big Tent USA. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Nancy Koziel, and I'm an advisor at Big Tent. I'm delighted to host this evening's discussion with voting rights champions Lauren Groargo and Mark Elias. At Big Tent USA, we put democracy over partisanship. We are a national women-led voter coalition dedicated to protecting democracy, women's reproductive rights, and our children and our grandchildren's future through education and civic engagement. The links. Now I'm thrilled to introduce you to our guest. Lauren Browargo is a top political democracy and civic engagement strategist, executive, and fighter for economic justice. In 2012, Lauren began a partnership with Stacey Abrams to chart and then execute a 10-year plan to build power and policy wins for Georgia. Spurred by the wide-scale voter suppression during the 2018 election, Lauren founded and is the CEO of Fair Fight Action, which focuses on fighting voter suppression and advancing voting rights. Fair Fight Action brings the full force of strategic campaign tactics, culturally relevant engagement, and voter education to those most targeted by suppression and disinformation. Fair Fight played a, la a leading role nationally and in battleground states in the 2020 election and the 2020 Georgia runoff. Mark Elias is the founder of Democracy Docket and a partner at Elias Law Group. He's a nationally recognized authority in voting rights, redistricting, and law. In 2020, Mark led the historic legal effort to protect voting rights, winning over 60 lawsuits against the GOP's efforts to suppress the vote. As Republicans continue to mount aggressive challenges to voting, Mark continues to fight back in court and on Twitter. Mark and Lauren are at the forefront of defending voting rights and combating voter suppression. Their unwavering commitment and groundbreaking work have had a significant impact on preserving the integrity of our democracy. Mark and Lauren, thanks for joining us under the Big Ten tonight. Let's get started. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nancy, Kitty, Sue, and the Big Tent team. It's wonderful to be with folks from all over the country tonight. I am here in Fulton County, Atlanta, Georgia, which apparently, you know, who knew that this was going to be the ground zero for Trump, uh, Bonnie Willis, for voter suppression, for battleground world. But that is where I am coming in tonight. I'm so thrilled to be with my friend and often strategic partner, Mark Elias, and I thought I would start our conversation between the two of us to kind of place us in time. Um, it's funny, almost exactly four years ago, lockdown and the pandemic was starting. We were in the presidential election, Trump v. Biden. We were in an open Democratic presidential primary. We were on the coming into what were really disastrous, tough early primary elections where there were long lines and lots of chaos and early voting issues because everybody was trying to learn how to live in lockdown. And I wanted to bring you all in on some of the strategy. I called I called Mark. I called a couple other national leaders, folks that I had I knew, but weren't I wasn't working with them closely at the time. And I called them and said, I think we need to form a really thoughtful set of strategic partnerships to really work on voter access this year with this unprecedented pandemic, while we were also facing unprecedented voter suppression and disinformation. And we began um, really thoughtful work together. You may remember ten, four years ago, we built out Fair Fight 2020, which is about voter protection infrastructure in all the battleground states. And we worked closely with a set of national partners across the political spectrum and nonpartisan spectrum to do that work. Mark uh, and a couple others, we merged into this kind of national group that really started thinking strategically about the crises at hand. Everything from you know what became a poll worker crisis, from voter protection efforts on the ground, to Mark obviously leading on all the post-election litigation to get the results actually locked in. And so part of the, how I thought I'd frame uh, this evening's conversation is what's the same and what's different as we go into Trump v. Biden 2.0, and go into a four years into the pandemic looking at voting. And there's a lot of things that have changed um, in the landscape overall, both organizationally, a lot more pro-democracy groups on the ground, lots more understanding about the threats to election administration that we're seeing from anti-voting forces, conspiracy forces. And so there's more of the same going on, but I think in some ways um, the threat has morphed a bit, remains very pernicious, and thinking about where we are today from four years ago, one of the big flags is that there are now many more anti-voting conspiracy theorists embedded into our election administration process. 
And I see some folks from Arizona here. Y'all can educate all of us on that. You know what's happening there. But all over the country in local boards of election, state election boards, um, there has been a populating of those entities of more anti-voter folks. That is a very big change. There are other changes. So we're going to kick it off with Mark talking about that sort of the differences this year, what he's seen from a litigation and legal front on what the anti-voter strategy is this year versus the pro-voter legal strategy this year, which are pretty different than four years ago. I, sh I think we can say fairly, Mark, especially coming in and thinking about in the spring. Then I'm going to talk about what we're seeing in state legislatures and how the rules may be changing this year, um, some of the top anti-voter strategies we're preparing for on the ground, and some of the election administration threats. And then Mark is going to, we're going to talk about post-election and preparing for that. And then we will talk a little bit more and open up for discussion. So Mark, um, love to, I always am, learn a lot from you and eager to hear from you tonight. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, it is great to see so many people engaged on these really, really critical questions for our democracy um, so early. You know, one of the things that's different uh, already is that, uh, Lauren. I think so that, early. you know, we were um, uh, four years ago, we were at the beginning. We were we were less far along in terms of a public education effort. You know, you guys at Fair Fight had started actually quite a bit earlier. We had started litigating a little bit earlier, um, but there wasn't really a public sense that this was as big of a problem um, around the rules of voting and election denialism as as became the case. I think I think there are three things that I would say are fundamentally different now than then. The first is that four years ago, um, believe it or not, there was not a hardened um, opposition to things like vote by mail. You know, when 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 um, then President Trump announced his opposition to vote by mail, it actually took many um, Republicans by surprise because in many states, Republicans were actually running successful uh, vote by mail programs. Um, in fact, uh, you know, some of the earliest conversations, Lauren, you and I had with some of the other progressive and civil rights organizations, there was some deep skepticism of vote by mail by communities of color and by others who didn't, who who really preferred uh, in-person voting, particularly early in-person voting. And so one of the profound differences is just how, um, how galvanized the other side, the anti-democracy forces, the kind of the uh, you know, the the anti-voting forces, how galvanized they have become against some things that, frankly, if you had told me four years ago, for example, there would be a war on drop boxes, I would have said that's crazy. Why would anyone care or whether you put the it in a secure metal container with a stamp or a secure metal container without a stamp? Like like there are some things that 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 are very different. So that's that's one thing. The second is that culturally in the country, and and this is one of the things I worry about is that you know we we now can easily divide people up into pro democracy and anti democracy, and there is now a full fledged election denier movement. Um, there is a big lie movement that, as you as you said in you know in your introduction, like is is real and it's well funded and it is um, it is quite organized. Um, you know, I saw go by uh, someone from Cochise County. You know, I've I've now sued Cochise County more times than I should ha ever have to um, uh, because, you know, election denialism became in many parts of Arizona, including uh, in some elements of that county, really, really ingrained and embedded in the, the folks uh, in power, but also among uh, a large segment of uh, of the voters. Uh, so I think that's the second difference right now. The third is that um, just on a pure litigation front, you know, in 2020, we were able to look at the landscape of laws and policies and practices that were really harming voters, particularly around the pandemic, but more generally, and be able to bring litigation. And I think it's fair to say we got the other side, you know, flat footed. Um, they are less flat footed. You know, there are in the interim, you know, there is a vast um, constellation of right wing organizations that have been well funded and are set up by people like Bill Barr, former attorney general, uh, set up by people like Stephen Miller, you know, former White House aide, um, uh, as well as, of course, some of the partisan players on the anti democracy side. And so, you know, we now it is no longer the case that all of the litigation people 
hear about is pro-democracy litigation. We actually right now this year, um, here's a statistic for you. There have been 19 anti-voting lawsuits filed just this year. That is more than pro-voting cases. So, so you know, there is now much more um, use view of the use of the courts by the anti-voting forces um, uh, that has really put stress and strain on a lot of budgets, put stress and strain on a lot of law firms and 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 folks um, uh, doing this work. I guess the last thing I would say, though, kicking it back to you, when you look at what's happening on the ground, I think the other macro theme, which is not really a litigation theme, but it is the thing I have been when people ask me in various forums, what are you most worried about? The thing I tell them is I'm most worried about right wing um, election vigilantism, you know, whether and, and we have seen that in the form of of people staking out drop boxes in Maricopa County with in body armor and intimidating people returning ballots. But there's really nothing that worries me more than the building out of an infrastructure to launch mass challenges. Um, around the country. And of course, the ground zero on that and the place where we have seen the most of it is Georgia. But I know that that is something that you and your team are very focused on. Thanks, Mark. Before I go, can you share with this community, be my impression, um, being involved in this as long as I have been, we've never seen this number of like restrictive anti-voting proactive state cases from anti-voting forces, correct? Like this is Oh, absolutely. And, and, I mean, I get, by any measure, I mean, you could you could measure it a lot of different ways, but by any measure, what we are seeing right now is a bigger legal assault by anti-voting forces in court than we have ever seen before, like by by orders of magnitude, you know, by orders of magnitude. Yeah. I saw a question in chat, like, could you give an example? So one that I've thought a lot about is I believe it's three cases that a variety of anti-voting outfits have filed against the elections manual in Arizona just in this year alone. And then yeah, in, a in a 10 day period, there were four lawsuits against Arizona involving their election manual, one by the RNC, one by Stephen Miller, uh, one by an in-state group of basically election deniers, and one by the legislature. Um, and all four of them were filed roughly within a 10-day period. And that, by the way, does not include a separate lawsuit that was also filed in that period against Maricopa County um, uh, for for the way in which it conducts elections. That's just something that would have been unheard of. Uh, last. It would have been unheard of last year, no less, yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. We'll get to, I see some questions about what people can do about this. We'll definitely get there. Um, so related to what Mark is saying and why... Uh, why it's very clear, we've always known this, the way money moves and the way operators move and organizational leaders move on the anti-voting side. But it's one of the things that um, I have noticed this year, very different than four years ago. A lot of the money and operatives on the anti-voting side have been organized, but this year they seem to be working in concert in a much more strategic way. So I'll give one example of that. Um, we saw the pushback on the Fani Trump case here in Fulton. I know you all have been reading the headlines. But what I can tell you on the ground, it's not just that Michael Roman, um, who Fani had in her case, was trying to delay his own accountability. Uh, Michael Roman is one of the lead architects of the MAGA voter suppression operation going all the way back into, I think, the 90s, correct, yeah. Mark? Absolutely. He yeah. was the operative that ended up getting, some of you remember, the RNC was under a consent decree that did not allow them to do their version of what we call voter protection um, because he got in trouble by having a racist uh, voter integrity operation at a polling location. This is the same guy who built out the MAGA operation, the MAGA voter suppression operation of four years ago, Michael Roman built out. And so he was part and parcel to the Trump phone call into Raffensperger to say find 11,000 votes. So Fani, you know, is on his list. Fani's gotten multiple guilty pleas. Well, Fani is the one who figured out the relationship that Fani was ha having in with Wade and launched that whole attack on her. What we're seeing, I think, is a great example of what we mean by a coordinated MAGA anti-voting strategy. They are not only fighting her in court and driving that, even though it's not a disqualifying legal issue, like really driving the optical issues. They have a couple of the MAGA folks, there aren't many, <laughs> in our very Democratic Fulton County Commission investigating her, launching public attacks. They have the fake elector, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones, who runs the state Senate, has he has got his, a couple of MAGA state senators 
having an unprecedented committee to subpoena and investigate Fonnie Willis. And so they're running that track. They have Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and Jim Jordan running multiple congressional investigations. And then they're running a very robust digital earned and paid media operation. That multi-layered legal comms political effort is not just in big ticket cases like Afani Willis. We are seeing that now in their litigation effort with real lawyers, not some of the, <laughs> not some of the less real lawyers, shall we say, Mark, um, really driving something. And um, so I think one of the things that we need to be aware of as we go into this, we often, you know, talk about the threats the threats here. I feel like the threat landscape is pretty significant, but it, but kind of manifesting differently. So that's an example. Another example that we're tracking along with other groups is all of the conspiracy theory, anti-voter, election denier, state legislation. And one of the things of note on this, similar to their litigation strategy, Mark, is they're not just doing, they're not just advancing or attempting to advance these bills with the MAGA coalitions in battleground states like Georgia and Michigan and Arizona, et cetera. They are running these, they are passing these bills in non-competitive fall states, places like Indiana, right? They, they have empowered their MAGA folks around the country to move all the sample legislation to sort of feed the beast of election denier. Yeah, they, and, they moved the piece of legislation earlier today in Alabama. Yes, I saw Literally. that in Alabama. Yeah. So the big categories we're seeing, and I think this informs, for me, it's helping us think about how we prepare for the fall. Because anything these interest groups are doing in state legislatures in the spring, those same interest groups are getting organized to work in the summer and fall, right? It's all the same groups, essentially. So a couple of things, I'll just tick through them really quickly. Allowing a lot of different kinds of bills around the country, trying to get more vigilantes, in my view, individuals, members of the public, able to inspect ballots. Really trying to change some of the rules to get Copies of ballots made available online, different different bills around ballot images. Some of this goes to some of the conspiracy theories of four years ago. Rules around vote tabulation and vote tabulation machines, you know, around some of the hysteria around that. Um, rules around how barcodes and QR codes are used on ballots. So stuff that kind of looks technical in the weeds, but it's sort of feeding the conspiracies around the vote being stolen four years ago, trying to just raise those questions and continue to giving their activists something to do. More banning of drop boxes. The drop box scandals continue, right? Uh, making them harder to access or banning them all out, right? Um, we're seeing more of that. All kinds of ballot image stuff, more, more rules trying to get more hand counts of ballots mm -hmm. required rather, um, rather than machine counts early on. Um, some, some stuff around um, sort of beefing up or altering how audits happen. But the two that I wanted to lift up for this group that I think are really interesting that cut across the big tent interest area. The first one for your situational awareness, I think is really interesting and dangerous is they're moving bills in states or using them as organizing and messaging bills like they are in Georgia on non-citizen voting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is no non-citizen voting in federal elections. There's almost no non-citizen voting in any local election. And in most states, Georgia included, it's against the law for non-citizens to vote. But they move these as messaging bills, but it goes along with one of the top disinformation strategies moving and disinformation sites currently in our country is a virulent anti-immigrant, anti-migrant scare campaign that's going on around all, you know, there's obviously the big ticket stuff we see in terms of the immigration fights and what's going on at the Texas border. But underneath that, there is just this grind of an organized disinformation campaign. And what is it meant to do? It's meant to all divide us up, right? And, and foment a lot of discord and create um, a lot of scare tactics. So that's mirrored by this non-citizen voting to give people, a, uh, give folks, some, some activists a way to manifest that, right? This uh, fake, you know, fake concern, essentially. And then the last one is mass challenges. Some of you remember after the big um, partisan wins in Georgia in the runoff that um, were the, diff you know, that were the, um, the difference in the Senate, we saw these omnibus voter suppression bills move all over the country, right, to, to roll back vote by mail, all those kinds of things, drop boxes. And in Georgia, many of you heard um, about this one SB202. It's famous because of the water ban. <laughs> it was just on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yep. 
<laughs> it, it was so mean, right? You can't give water to a poor voter standing in line. And by the way, it does get hot here still sometimes in the fall, uh, especially down on the coast. Um, so that terrible, mean-spirited bill. But what else was in there was they saw the mass challenge, some of you remember, a couple weeks before the Warnock-Ossoff runoff. True the Vote, one of these notorious anti-voting organizations, allegedly nonpartisan, but often gets caught openly coordinating with partisan actors, uh, you know, lodged a challenge trying to kick over 300,000 Georgians off the rolls a couple of weeks before that election. Fair fight mobilized on the ground. We were able to get most of the counties to shut them down. And then we worked with Mark Elias and we actually sued True the Vote. And we're still in court suing them on this um, uh, attempt to kick people off the ballot so close to an election. Well. Georgia, they said, and all over the country said, that was great. We should make that easier. But they're even trying to go farther this year. <laughs> in Georgia and a couple other states, they're actually trying to make the mass challenge laws worse. Why? Because they are trying to feed the base of their conspiracy theorists, who they are beholden to, right, and make it even easier for vigilantes to go out. And so the mass challenge piece in particular is a larger strategy that they are running. And I want to be clear that this is a strategy and not a tactic, because it's a, it's a strategy that goes to kicking people off the rolls, jamming up the elections officials so they can't do other parts of their job. They're jamming them with these, they're jamming them with open records requests um, because it's something else that the boards of elections have to deal with. They've got to go through a whole process to reject them, to make sure it's not probable cause. Then if they think there may be probable cause, they got to send letters to voters. So it's an explicit on the record as in, in the media, some of these outfits have been saying, one of the aims of this is not just to try to kick people off the ballot, it's trying to jam elections officials and jam their offices up to make election administration harder. So say maybe maybe part of what they want to do is make it harder to have more early vote access. You know, all of these sort of things we could speculate on. And then they want to create doubt around the results, right? They want to say, we lodged a 100,000 you know, 100, challenge to X county in Georgia or Arizona or Michigan, and then they get rejected because they're specious challenges, then after the election, they can say, well, of that 100,000 challenge, we actually think, you know, a thousand of them voted, and now we're going to create doubts around the results. And so it does all of this, but obviously, those of you who have been students of voter suppression know that mass challenges have been around since Jim Crow. They were always a way for vigilantes to threaten Black voters and to create a chilling effect around voting. In fact, there's a great Democracy Docket article that historian Carol Anderson did on this very point that I suggest you all read. So that is one of the strategies that we're up against. And some of you know Fair Fight, you know, the way we think about these strategies, not only are we defending voters, we want to create every crisis as an opportunity to educate voters about their power and that if they didn't have power, they wouldn't try to do this. And so that is a, a big strategy um, that we have seen in the past that they are scaling up this year. And then, um, and that's also a little bit different than four years ago. I mean, Mark, we weren't talking about math challenges four years ago at this time. They really started pushing and innovating on that for the Georgia runoff right. and then that's really right. have expanded it from there. Um, so any, any more comments on that, Mark? And then I thought um, the next piece to talk about would be how all this could impact a post-election. We've already had a bunch of questions about that overall. Sure. So why don't we move to post-election and we will um, talk about other things that people have on their minds. But look, um, here's the thing about um, the post-elections. The first thing I always tell folks is that I actually got into all this work because I was a post-election lawyer. I did uh, I did a Senate um, election contest for Mary Landrieu in 1996. I was Harry Reid's <laughs> recount lawyer in 1998. Uh, Maria Cantwell's in 2000. I was not in Florida. In Washington State, we won that recount. Um, uh, you know, I've done a number of them over the years. Al Franken in two thousand eight, uh, uh, and on and on and on. And and what I tell folks is like, yes, in a very close election, the post-election world, litigation world, matters a lot. The goal is for it to not be a close election. So the first thing I want to tell everyone is do everything you can to get people to register to vote. Do everything you can to make sure that they vote and do everything you can to make sure that their ballot counts. Because if you do those things first, it is the best protection against everything else that happens in the post-election. So I don't wanna minimize post-election because it's very important, but but please don't get distracted from the the really, really important work that Big Tent and all of these organizations that that it supports and it highlights like Fair Fight, don't, don't lose focus on their work 
because of the post-election, because we have to first make sure that everyone is able to vote and we have elections. In terms of post-election, look, here is the deal. Um, I was fortunate enough to represent President Biden um, and the DNC in the aftermath of the 2020 election. There were 65 lawsuits. We won 64 of them. There were uh, three states uh, that had um, significant post-election recounts uh, of one sort or another. Um, uh, uh, one was Georgia, Georgia had two <laughs> unto itself. Uh, uh, Wisconsin had one. Nevada didn't have a recount, but it effectively had a full out contest. Um, and then we saw a lot of other litigation around, around the place. Um, ultimately, all of those cases failed for two reasons. First, they failed because um, President Biden had won by a very comfortable margin. So, you know, I sometimes tell folks, you know, when I, the 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 the, out, the the ability to reverse the outcome of elections is is not easy. It's and it's limited to so very very close elections. You know, in two thousand eight, I represented Al Franken, as I mentioned. We went from certified loser to winner, but we were talking about moving a few hundred votes. You know, through that entire through that entire process. So the first reason why the post election litigation failed is because the Trump campaign were was were making legal arguments that were pretty frivolous because they were trying to overcome margins that were simply not overcomable. Like Joe Biden won by, by close margins, but not super close margins. The second reason why they failed um, is uh, because they had terrible lawyers. You know, um, they had terrible legal strategy. They, you know, they, they had, you know, Rudy Giuliani, you forget, their, their, their elite strike forces, they called it, was Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, and um, Sidney Powell. Um, uh, two of those, two of those three have since been indicted. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, uh, all three of them are, have been, uh, have been disciplined by the bar and at least a couple of them likely to lose their bar licenses. Like, like they did not have, um, the best legal representation. The one thing I want to take seriously moving forward is, you know, Michael Watnley just took over as RNC chair. I just wrote something about this for democracy. It was published this morning. Um, you know, and, and. He, Michael Watley is a election denier, denying lawyer from North Carolina, but he's not, he's not a, he's not a bad lawyer. I mean, I've litigated against the North Carolina Republican party. He's, he, he sort of knows which way's up, even if he's an election denier. Um, and he's brought in a couple of other people, Bill McGinley, who, uh, uh, you know, is a tenacious, uh, litigator. He is now their outside lawyer for what they call election integrity, which is essentially voter suppression. And their new chief counsel, uh, Charlie Spees, longtime Republican lawyer. He had actually worked for Mitt Romney. He had worked for Jeb Bush's super PAC and said that Donald Trump uh, was a fraud. Uh, so, you know, like they, they have what they have managed to do since 2020 is is really pretty remarkable. They have both built a fringe movement into the mainstream, right? They have created kind of like this MAGA, you know, movement of election deniers. But the other thing is they've been able to co-opt a lot of the establishment type figures into their movement. You know, I, something that I have, I, I wrote an article that was entitled, Brad Rassenberger is a Republican vote suppressor. Um, I wanted to be very direct and blunt in my thesis. Um, <laughs> Brad Rassenberger is a Republican vote suppressor. Like Brad Rassenberger is in court today as we speak, trying to eviscerate the ability of private litigants to bring claims under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. This was such a fringe theory that it didn't even register on anyone's radar screen four years ago. And he's what passes, he is what passes for like a mainstream Republican, right? So like, it, they're just, you need to understand, I'm not saying this is a partisan matter, I'm just saying like, you need to understand that the anti-voting forces have really coalesced and, and been able to bring into their fold a lot of people who would have been skeptics, uh, I think, four years ago. And I think that that potentially will make the post-election um, uh, a little bit trickier uh, if you have a very close election. But the final thing I want to say is Donald Trump incited an insurrection um, in 2021. Um, since then, he's been indicted in four cases. He faces the prospects of prison. Um, his entire universe is organized right now based on the premise that he will become president and somehow be able to pardon himself or, you know, undo these trials. If you think he will be less desperate in the post-election of 2024, you're wrong. If you think that there is that the lesson that was learned from from January 6, 2021 was be be more careful with your language, he just said that there'll be a that there'll be a bloodbath if if uh, if he doesn't win. Um, last statistic that 
uh, you may find chilling. Um, when Donald Trump went to court, I'm sorry, when the state of Texas went to court in the post-election in 2020 to try to throw out the results in four states, okay, literally asked the Supreme Court to throw out the election results in four states, 126 members of Congress um, signed on to that brief. On the night of January 6th, after the violence, 139 members voted to block certification of the election. So what you all experienced, which was a repulsive event, actually gained votes. <laughs> it actually it actually whipped more votes into that camp. The person who was leading that brief was the now Speaker of the House, con then Congressman Johnson. The person whipping the votes on the floor is the now Speaker of the House, Speaker Johnson. And if you look most recently at the amicus briefs filed in the U.S. Supreme Court in the immunity cases and then the kicking them off the, you know, the Colorado ballot case, you're now talking about 170, 180 members of Congress signing on to it. So the challenges in the post-election, I worry, will be harder. So the best thing we can do is all of you do your work to make sure everyone's registered to vote, make sure everyone gets a ballot, everyone is, is able to vote and have their vote counted. And one of the big points of evidence on that is they have been fighting so hard in Georgia, but remember, they ne they didn't fight on the Warnock runoff win in 21 or 22. Those margins were too big. So our mission collectively is to get the pro-voter, pro-democracy candidates uh, elected and to do our work to do the voter education around it. And the way Fair Fight thinks about this is we think about the voter suppression mitigation fights around the things that have the ability to impact the close margin. One of the operative terms for the close election that Mark is referring to, we call it a voter protection margin, where uh, it's a margin close enough that absentee ballots that are thrown out or voters that are challenged, um, that kind of small number of people, the number of provisional ballots and how they get counted, that you get in a voter protection margin when you're when you're having to count those votes to make sure you're securing your victory or to find the votes to get to your win. And so in states that have that narrow of a margin, that's where the biggest fights will happen. And that's why mass challenges are something we all have to fight because they create the volume that can create doubt in situations like we had four years ago for the close states. Obviously, Georgia was really close with 11,000 votes in a big state. That is a obviously why Georgia is such such a key place for the strategy because we know the MAGA folks are very focused on winning Georgia this year because Trump was personally, we know, aggrieved that he lost that state. But that's why we're seeing it around the country as one of their many strategies, as well as making sure that they have a real voice in the elections process by getting on these boards of elections. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of lessons that I know I've taken, we've all taken from four years ago. Uh, there's new things on the horizon, but you know every crisis is an opportunity to work with voters and educate voters about our power, um, uh, our power actually here. They wouldn't be trying so hard to hire all these lawyers and do all these strategies and make things miserable if our vote didn't matter. And that is where we find a lot of power in the messaging around voter suppression is to flip it on its head and make it plain that this is what it is. And we have actually found in our research and in our work across the country that as the disinformation escalates um, directly into communities, uh, Black voters right now are seeing unprecedented disinformation that's very well architected, meant to divide and conquer, and, and it's sort of a modern form of voter suppression, for example. So as all of that escalates, our mission is to get out there with empowering messages and make sure people understand that they wouldn't be you know, pushing all of this were their vote not important. With that, um, Kitty, we're happy we can move on to questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. So um, I think what might be helpful is to look at two states in particular. Um, you brought them up in your conversations. They were brought up in the chat. Um, we actually have a couple of people from Arizona here. Um, so what I'd like to do is sort of think about election denialism and election subversion in, the, um, in, in Arizona and then voter suppression in Georgia, so that we can sort of get into the weeds of each one of those lanes, although of course they overlap. And also if you can sort of talk about how 
the structure of money and mainstream Republicans, who we were also grateful to Brad Raffensperger, are now a part of this universe that's trying to subvert an election or suppress votes. So um, if that works for you guys, I'd, I'd love to start with Arizona. I mean, Katie, L Kate, Carrie Lake, I, ugh, whatever. She's talking about like, she wants to get rid of all voting machines. And this really great woman from Arizona who's with us tonight was like, 10 tons of paper were thrown out because it was supposed to be, you know, fraud proof paper. And so I, I think after 2022, a lot of people were like, oh, all those crazy election deniers lost. I'm in great shape. But clearly on the local level, something else happened. So let's go Arizona. Let's go crazy cuckoo first, and then we'll go to Georgia. Sure. So let me give Mark, you, some you want data. to start with your, yeah, yeah start with your lawsuit. So let me give you some, let me give you some data about Arizona. Right now, there are 14 lawsuits in Arizona. Okay. There are 14 active lawsuits in the state of Arizona about how the election will be conducted in 2024. And I don't have exactly the breakdown of good guy, bad guy, but I believe more than half of them. In fact, I'm confident more than half of them are filed by the bad guys, you know, by election deniers. Um, you know, four of them against the election procedure manual, which just to be clear, the election procedure manual is what it sounds like. It is the manual that local election officials and counties use to conduct the elections. So, so you know, the attacks on this document, which by the way, include one of the lawsuits wants, attacks it because it says that it prohibits voter intimidation and harassment of election officials, and it wants that provision struck. Okay, the RNC wants the entire manual struck down. So there is a very, very well-organized effort in Arizona to both perpetuate the election denier movement, to spread some basic lies about elections in Arizona. One of the lies about elections in Arizona and anywhere is that somehow you are better off hand counting ballots. If you, know, if you started hand counting ballots uh, on the, the moment the polls closed in a state the size of Arizona, or frankly any state, it would take you weeks to count all the ballots. There is a reason why we don't hand count ballots in this country. They're just the elect. There simply aren't enough people to count hand count ballots. Um, that's beyond the question of whether or not, frankly, machine counts are more accurate in many instances. Not all, but in many. But as an initial first count, um, the machine count is always going to be the the preferred way to do it. And their reasons for not wanting machine counting is because honestly, they have been lied to so many times, and they are perpetuating those lies now that they believe things like there are bamboo filaments in ballots that can prove they came from China. You know, that there is some kind of Sharpie. I litigated three cases that literally went by the name Sharpie Gate. Um, we had Sharpie Gate 1, Sharpie Gate 2, Sharpie Gate 3, which was some belief that in Maricopa County, they were having people mark ballots with Sharpies and they were bleeding through the paper and causing errors. There were no Sharpies. No one used the Sharpie. There was no bleeding through the paper. But like, there's just so much misinformation. And and one of the things that has created an ecosystem in Arizona that is really actually quite sad for the state, I, you know, I mean, I worry about it from a democracy standpoint, but it's quite sad is you have lawyer waves of lawyers after lawyers after lawyers who are lining up still to this day to file frivolous cases and get sanctioned. You know, there was a case that was filed not that long ago in the post-election of of the Lake um, uh, Hobbs uh, uh, election, where Katie Hobbs won, where one of the lawyers said the reason why he took the case is because he was older, and therefore he figured that whoever brought the case was going to get sanctioned and maybe disbarred, and he was older and therefore better able. He was at the end of his legal career, so if he got disbarred, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. You know, we just literally had Mike Lindell join with uh, join with. Um, uh, uh, with um, uh, with the Republicans, with Kerry Lake, in filing that machine case, which they have lost in Arizona, and which their lawyers and Kerry Lake got sanctioned. Like, they have been fined and sanctioned for bringing that case. They have now made a spectacle of filing that in the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, do I think it's going to succeed in the U.S. Supreme Court? No. Do I worry that these cases are going to succeed? By and large, no, although there, I'm now learning the entire geography of rural counties in, in uh, Arizona because they are trying to bring more and more cases in rural count, rural red counties rather than in uh, Maricopa, but so be it. Um, uh, you know, the, the, but the 
But I don't so much think that the problem is in Arizona is that they're going to win these cases. It is that they are inciting an entire population by lying to them constantly about almost everything about how elections should be conducted. And so getting, you know, democracy relies not just on ballots being cast and counted, but it relies on a consensus, a pageantry of democracy that we all join in after election day, in which we lift up the winners and we celebrate that we had free and fair elections. And in Arizona, almost more than any other state, that never happened after 2020. And it didn't happen in 2021. It didn't happen in 2022. It The opposite of it happened after the governor's race in 2022. You know, we represented uh, the governor. Uh, uh, Governor Hobbs and the court cases against that were brought by by um, Carrie Lake, and now Carrie Lake is just rolling that into the next election. So I, I'm very worried about Arizona, not so much because I think these cases are successful, but because I think it's really corrosive to the to the to the democracy and, and the culture necessary to have a healthy democracy. I will yeah, say, Allie, oh sorry, I just wanted to read this great quote from mm -hmm. um, one of our Arizona guests. Allie Morse, um, she said, our former county election elections, Lisa Mara was sued by her supervisors because she refused to conduct an illegal hand count. Yeah. She resigned and is now election director of Arizona and in the Arizona Secretary of State's office. She's an exceptional election professional. So yeah, and, we, and that's, Co <laughs> that's, that's Cochise County. We wound up right. suing Cochise County twice. Cochise County simply refused to follow the law. And I believe the state of Arizona has now indicted a couple of the local election officials who refused to follow the law, who gave that very hardworking, good election director. You know, I don't know her personally. For all I know, she's a Republican, right? but but she did her job. She was just all she was trying to do is her job. And and she was constantly being told by the by these folks that they wanted her to break the law. And she wouldn't. Good for her. And um, and that's but 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 again, the culture of it is really problematic. Yeah. One of the, Sorry, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, one of the pieces I will say that's a big difference from four years ago in Arizona, where we did a ton of work four years ago to help them build um, their early voter protection infrastructure all and um, worked with a bunch of the groups. We ended up four years ago, I ended up working a lot with the Hobbs administration when she was secretary of state. And four years ago, the Arizonans, and many of you will remember, she was the only pro voter, <laughs> to put it mildly, elect a constitutional office holder. In fact, she had one of the big voter fraud conspiracy attorney generals um, at the time. And that was her lawyer that she had to use um, as being the secretary of state. She, the, the, he was rolling out voter fraud task forces uh, last spring, along with Brad Raffensperger and others, saying we're going to prosecute anybody who commits voter fraud. And so we worked with leaders in Arizona to stand up a parallel to what we had in, in Georgia called a voter empowerment task force because they were rolling out voter fraud task forces. So we wanted to make sure we were in the media so voters could hear the voter empowerment task force too. And here's here, who to go to if um, investigators start knocking on your doors, which is what happened four years ago in Arizona um, and Georgia, they started trying to criminalize voting and, and do all this fear stuff. Now, good news is we now have Katie Hobbs, an elections expert as a governor, and we have pro-voter secretary of state and attorney general, right? This is one of those things right. where on things you can do is AG races, secretary of state races, as well as all of our state legislative races are so important um, all the time. So that is one thing that was a, there was a, huge amount of work in our ecosystem to support Secretary of State Hobbs and her team. And I mean, you name it, um, we were all we were all hustling to support her. How is she going to get more legal help if she if she can't get pro voter legal help from the attorney general? Like what are ways the outside world can help? You know, how do we help physically protect her? Right. And so her team is seasoned and understands this. So so I feel like, yes, a lot of the county level stuff, obviously they can't intercede on, but having a strong Secretary of State AG and governor is a huge change from Absolutely. four years ago. That's very positive. And so, you know, if I was in Arizona, I would be looking to those guys to figure out, as well as our good folks in the county on how to help. So in, in really good news, Fair Fight is doing a lot less in Arizona because of that this year, because we now have really strong leaders in the state that can do backup. And so, you know, our messaging and other help is mainly how we're working there. Um, Shall we go to Georgia, Ms. Douglas? Yeah, it'd be great. Oh, <laughs> yes, please do. 
Um, and, and just, I wanted to make sure that I get this question in, um, just if you can explain what a mass challenge, challenge is when you're talking about Georgia, I think that'd be yep. really helpful for all of us. And also yep. who's behind, where's, where's the money coming from for all this? This is expensive to file all these lawsuits. And I know that Mark and I know that Fair Fight are involved in two in Georgia, but talk to us about the behind the scenes uh, situation because it's it's got to be really you, you must feel like you're underwater sometimes. So right now we're not we're not underwater. What they're what they're doing on mass challenges is and how how it works on these mass challenges in Georgia and in most states is you need to be a registered voter in the county. The idea on challenges, the sort of theory on, on, on how they might be used is if Mark Elias lives across the street from me, and I know that Mark Elias sold his house and moved to DC, but I notice that I check my voter rolls and I see that he's there and registering, I could go to my registrar and challenge his ability to be registered because I personally know he doesn't live there anymore. Now. Why would I do that to my neighbor when there's already all this federally mandated list maintenance and there's no actual voter fraud that happens in this country, right? Like it's hard enough getting voters to vote in their own state and election, let alone people are not voting in multiple elections. This is just not a thing that actually happens in our country. Um, but that's the idea on a challenge. And so these laws in Georgia and other states are that if you are an elector in a county, you can challenge another voter. And the idea is that you have personal knowledge that they are not registered. These laws have expanded so that I can pull my, you know, the list, the voter file lists are public. I can pull my county list. And there's different ways they de define probable cause, but I can say I am challenging these thousands of voters because I believe they're dead, or I believe they moved, or I believe they don't live there, or I believe they are unhoused homeless people who actually are, uh, living in DeKalb County, not living in Fulton County, um, all kinds of these theories, right? And then the law says you have to have probable cause before they can be thrown out. And that's where the ground is shifting under us, where they're, where they're trying to give them more and more leeway in these laws on how they do it. So the ones we've seen thus far this year in Georgia is they're doing their own. They've, it, a couple different outfits, True the Vote, this new Eagle AI group, um, and others. They train their volunteers. We like to call them vigilantes because that's what it's been in the South. It's been like racist vigilantes go challenge a bunch of black voters. That is the theory. And, and in Jim Crow, they used the same language that they were just trying to have clean, accurate voter rolls. I was sitting in a legislative hearing in Georgia, listening to these MAGA guys use the same language as the Jim Crow era about why we need it. I got news, since the Jim Crow era, there's a lot better data and technology and list maintenance. It wasn't necessary then, it's sure as heck not necessary now. So one of the ways, and the list that we've seen thus far, they're running their own <laughs> analysis on their little laptop, uh, sometimes empowered by some of the tech from the national group, sometimes not, where they're getting access to a registered voter list in North Carolina and doing their own rudimentary matching against Fulton County or you name your county and saying, oh, there's a Kitty Douglas registered in Fulton County. There's a Kitty Douglas registered in Durham. Um, she needs, we need to challenge her, right? Not knowing that there could be a million Kitty Douglases, first of all, and I know probably not, very unique name. I have a unique name too. Uh, but in any event, those kinds of, those are the kinds of challenges we're seeing. And the counties are just rejecting them because they come with no probable cause. They don't have the data to back it up. Uh, but that's one of the examples of it. In 2021 runoff, True the Vote challenged over 300,000 voters. And you know, one of the categories of voters, we have a lot of military bases in Georgia. There was a large number of military addresses. They were challenging military families that they're saying that they don't live there anymore. So of course we let them have it in the media. Why are we, why are we trying to knock military? Who knows where they're living? If they want to be registered in Georgia because they're serving, Fine, right? So in any event, that's the kind of stuff we see. You know, it's they're trying to do this alchemy around um, change of address, et cetera. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was going to say, it started in Georgia and it's still biggest in Georgia, but it's spreading. You know, there's a New York Times article that talked about how it is spreading uh, to Nevada and Michigan. Uh, just yesterday, I saw an article that that a group in Pennsylvania has challenged 10,000 voters. Um, uh, uh, and in Alle it is in Allegheny County. 
um, which is Pittsburgh. Um, and in different states, the standards differ. You know, in, in Georgia, there is this one process. In other states, they have other processes. And But here's, at the end of the day, the problem with these mass challenges. These are, these are, as Lauren said, these are filed by people who do not know the people who they are challenging. They don't know anything about them other than what they're seeing on a piece of paper. And, you know, for everyone on this call, you're sitting here thinking, well, if I got one of these challenges, I would just show that that's not me. Like that, that's not like I didn't move, you know, right? Um, but that's that's because you are interested enough to be on a call or be on a Zoom with me and Lauren at uh, <laughs> after 7 p.m. Um, and and but for most voters, you know, they they may be interested in voting like this much, <laughs> right? But they're not interested in doing it if it's going to be if they are going to be taking on some kind of risk or putting themselves in the middle of some kind of dispute. So for many of these voters, when they hear that they are on a list of people who has been challenged, for unfortunately for some of them, they're just like, okay, <laughs> you know, like I, you know, like I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to cause trouble, right? And and so I think we, un, I think we, I think we underestimate the psychological impact that these voter suppression tactics have. You know, you you might wait on a long line once. But you're not going to come back the second time, right? Because you, you, you know, you might be willing to wait in line for an hour one time. But for a lot of voters, they're like, I got, I got child care to take care of. I got, I got, I got work. I'm losing money when I'm waiting in line. So a lot of these things that that for many people like you on this call, you can't imagine are barriers to voting. The other side knows they are a barrier to voting. They are a dissuasive barrier and they are an intimidation barrier. And that's what some of the evidence showed up, showed a trial in the in the case that we litigate for uh, our litigating for uh, for uh, fair fight against true the vote. Like, you know, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the voter who has done nothing wrong and is now all of a sudden getting an official letter from Fulton County <laughs> that you know they're that they're made that they may have to have a hearing and they're thinking all right i don't want a hearing <laughs> I, yeah, I just want to you know. assuming they even get the letter and a lot of these mass challenge laws they're they're intimidating letters for for anybody even if they're written in a non intimidating way that is fundamentally intimidating that you're be your right to vote's being challenged and you're going to have to come to a hearing right or if you miss the letter because we all miss our mail all the time and you show up to vote and say yeah. the county rejected you, but say the vigilantes are there in person because most of these newer laws allow you to challenge at the polling location. Yeah. And so this creates not just for the individual voter, it creates an, a chilling effect in the environment, right, overall. And you know we have seen this just time and again, especially in rural South Georgia, which is heavily African-American, small, small communities um, has been incredibly important for you know, winning races. Um, it's an area where we expect to see more and more of this because the counties don't have a lot of wherewithal and um, to push back. So I think we're going to keep seeing them in the bigger places like the Alleghenies, the Pittsburghs, um, the Atlantas. But I we're preparing on if they start expanding out to smaller counties as part of an intimidation strategy, preparing for the post-election fights as well as um, those pieces overall. So I feel like in Georgia, it's and Georgia in the South, with the long history of very racialized voter suppression, you know, many of you saw what happened. Um, it became such a big public story. What happened to the election worker here locally, Ruby Freeman? A lot of what Fair Fight does is very behind the scenes. So that's another great example. If you don't remember, Ruby Freeman was the Fulton County elections worker who got accused at the highest level by both Giuliani and Trump directly that she was like smuggling drugs and like stealing ballots under the table based on some camera footage they saw. And, you know, she sued them for defamation, was successful. It's been a long story. She went to Congress and everything else. But when it first happened to her, she lost her livelihood. Her family lost her livelihood. She had Republican operatives knocking on her door, MAGA operatives knocking on her door. She had to leave her house. She was destitute. And um, that's the kind of behind the scenes work that we're preparing is I was the first person who talked to Ruby Freeman, who wasn't law enforcement or a MAGA person. And we figured out how to get her direct cash assistance and support. And we paid for a lawyer for her that eventually led to. So as we think about voter protection, also the chilling effect on elections workers, one of the, you know, there's been a lot of conversation and we're wrapping up. I want to give a couple of things that people can do. Number one, I don't care where you live. The elections workers crisis is a nationwide crisis. I strongly urge everybody 
especially if you have the free time to be on calls, to become a poll worker or to see, even take it a step further and see if you want to get involved in your local board of elections. The MAGA folks in the most non-MAGA counties are organizing. And so we need folks, pro-voter folks in those rules. It's something that can be done everywhere. And then have your you and your family always check your registration, especially if you have folks living in battleground states where sometimes people get kicked off the rolls. That's something you can do. And then subscribe to the Democracy Docket. Mark Elias has the best newsletter if you're interested in this topic. And then give to Fair Fight. Fair Fight Action, our 501c4, the majority of our work is nonpartisan, pro-voter education and voter suppression mitigation to those most impacted by voter suppression. You can sign up to volunteer on our website. Um, we plug people in nationally to volunteer opportunities with our allies. And obviously we do a ton of program on the ground in Georgia. Those are really great ways that you can help. Um, and then just to echo everything Mark and the Big Ten folks have been texting, which is we got to turn on the vote. We got to educate the vote. And so part of what we do with our list is make sure we're we're engaging them in civic engagement activities, but also plugging people into really great ones. Big Ten has a lot of great options for you. So that's really what we need. We don't, we don't, we need culturally competent on the ground support for elections workers and voters. So you don't need to be flying, you know, around the country necessarily, um, unless you've got ties to that place. What we need is money and volunteers and a national network and amplification. I can't say this enough that we can do this. They wouldn't be trying all these dirty tricks. If they, if they, you know, didn't think we had power and this is all on the margins, but the margins are going to matter. So that would be my general kind of call to action is that despite all of this, I remain optimistic that because of groups like Big Ten, y'all weren't this big four years ago, right? There is so Ten got many, bigger. Ten yeah. got bigger. Ten got bigger. Ten. They had to get a new tent. The, ten, the other tent got <laughs> outgrown. Ten to get bigger. This is good. I know we right? have like a little prop tent, but we need yeah. to go like circus exactly. tent. Exactly. I remember being yeah. on this four years ago and it was much longer. So in any event, I, I am optimistic. And um, I also think, you know, we have a lot of more, we have a lot more leaders in place in a lot of these states. You know, you think about, we have a great governor in Michigan. People are way more prepared going into this than ever before. And so we have a lot of work to do, but I, I feel like it's work that can be done. We can do it. And we all came through 2020. The thing I'll say for those of you who are contributors into this part of the space, one of the things I'll say, and I, Mark and I talked a lot about this through the years, is just how much stronger those connection points are in the pro-voter sector from the partisan to the nonpartisan actors. We've all figured out better ways to lawfully communicate in a way that advances voting rights. Um, and helps elect pro-voter candidates. So that's another really good news piece, I would say, for y'all, Kitty. We'll end on some good news because it's almost eight o'clock. And I just <laughs> want to say thank you so much to Lauren and Mark and your teams and the great work that you do. We hope you'll come back to Big Ten because we know that this is a topic that's only going to heat up. And we want to highlight your work and we want to highlight the voters that you're serving and just to remind people that it's really important that we stay engaged and we've got some great letter writing campaigns. We've got some great ways to check your voter ID and your um, voter registration at Big Tent. So I hope you'll come back. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who came and um, we'll see you guys under the tent <laughs> next time. <laughs> the Big Tent. Big Tent. <laughs> Thank Huge you, Big tent. <laughs> big tent. So big. <laughs> Have a good day. Good night, everyone.